Welcome, friends. Today we're gonna talk about Generation 1 Pokemon and what the competitive atmosphere for that looks like. I'll explain everything that you need to know to be good at this game. First, we'll talk about the unique rules, and then the differences between Red, Blue, and Yellow Link battles versus Pokemon Stadium. And then we'll individually go through what each of the Pokemon do, and what its best moves are, and what kind of roles it can play in a team. And then at the end, I'll give you a handful of sample teams using some different strategies to help you get started, and some additional resources that I think are very helpful. So first off, accuracy and evasion altering moves are usually banned. It's no nonsense here. Next, OU stands for overused. And that means that we don't play with the super mega powerful Mew and Mewtwo. The Mews are banned. And when you include them, that format is called Ubers. So Mew and Mewtwo are banned, but everyone else is on the table. But you can only play one of each Pokemon, and this is called Species Clause. But the different stages of evolution are also considered different species. So if you really wanted to, you could play with both a Gengar and a Haunter, but just not two Gengars, for example. The other clauses that we commonly play with are Freeze Claws, which means that no more than one Pokemon on each team can get frozen at a given time, and Sleep Claws, which means that no more than one Pokemon on each team can be put to sleep at a given time. Now, the way that Sleep Claws works is the first difference between playing on a Link Battle versus playing on Stadium. There is no Sleep Claws or any clauses at all in Cartridge Link Battles, but we mod them in for net play. So if you're playing on Pokemon Showdown, for example, you'll be playing with all of these clauses like Sleep Claws and Freeze Claws. But if you're playing the real game off of your Game Boy using a Link Cable, then there will be none of these clauses. Also, in Netplay Link Battles, Sleep Clause does not include putting your own Pokémon to sleep with its own move like Rest. So if you put a Pokémon to sleep with Rest, your opponent could still put a different Pokémon to sleep using an attack that would put it to sleep. But in Pokémon Stadium, your Rest counts as the Sleep for Sleep Clause. So in Pokémon Stadium, if you put a Pokémon to sleep with Rest, then all of your other Pokémon will be immune to an attack that would put them to sleep so long as that one Pokémon is still sleeping from the rest. The next difference between Pokémon Stadium and Link Battles is that Sleep in Cartridge Link Battles lasts for 0 to 6 turns, which is 1 to 7 attacks. And Sleep can be a death sentence in Generation 1 Link Battles, it just lasts for so long. However, in Pokémon Stadium, Sleep was reduced to 0 to 3 turns, which is 1 to 4 attacks. Also, in both Stadium and in Link Battles, Rest puts your Pokémon to sleep for exactly two attacks. And also in both, Pokémon do not attack on the turn that they wake up. So the turn that you would wake up, it just says that you wake up, and you don't get to do a move on the turn that you wake up. So a faster Pokémon can keep putting you back to sleep if you don't switch. Freeze is another death sentence in Gen 1, as Pokémon do not ever thaw out on their own. Freeze is permanent until a frozen Pokémon is hit with an attack that has a chance to burn. Like Fire Blast or Flamethrower, but not Fire Spin, for example, because Fire Spin doesn't have a chance to burn. So Sleep and Freeze are very powerful effects in Gen 1. And Freeze works the same in both Stadium as it does in Link Battles. The next difference between these two is Hyper Beam. So in Link Battles, Hyper Beam doesn't force a recharge if the target was knocked out or if it misses. But in Pokémon Stadium, Hyper Beam always forces a recharge, even on a KO and even on a miss. So Hyper Beam is a lot weaker in Stadium, but Hyper Beam is still very, very good in Link Battles. Another difference is that Stadium changed how recoil moves work, so that you don't take recoil if the target was knocked out by the attack, which includes Substitute, and speaking of Substitute, in Red, Blue, and Yellow, Substitute does not block status moves. So if you are behind a Substitute, you still get paralyzed by a Thunder Wave, for example. However, in Stadium, Substitute was changed so that it does block status moves. The next small change is that in Stadium, Haze will also cure special conditions, like Paralysis or Burn, for example, as well as removing all of the stat changes. 
Another small change is that in red, blue, yellow, 100% accuracy moves have a 1 in 256 chance of missing. And Stadium has a calculation that does a reroll when this would happen, and 100 accuracy moves instead now have a 1 in 65,536 chance to miss. Another thing that Stadium fixes is that in red, blue, yellow, moves that recover HP will fail if the difference between the user's maximum HP and the current HP leaves a remainder of 255 when divided by 256, such as 255 or 511. If your HP is at these exact numbers, then recover and soft boil will fail. So if you're playing a link battle, pay attention to your exact HP numbers but Stadium also fixes this. Another difference is Focus Energy. In the cartridge game of Red, Blue, Yellow, Focus Energy is just programmed wrong, and instead of raising your crit chance, it actually lowers it. But this is fixed in Pokemon Stadium, and Focus Energy can turn a Pokemon into a very commanding threat. Something else about Gen 1 is that crit rate is calculated with base speed, not current speed. Moves that raise your speed don't affect your crit chance. But the faster the Pokémon's base speed, the better its crit chance is. And so critical attacks are very frequent in Gen 1. And moves with high crit rate, used by a fast Pokémon, will basically always crit. Like Slash from Persian, for example. Now the calculation is a bit different between Stadium and Link Battles, but not by much. In Stadium, the slower Pokémon have a slightly higher crit rate, and the faster ones have a slightly lower crit rate. Another important thing to know about critical hits is that critical hits are not affected by damage modifiers like light screen or reflect, and don't calculate with stat changes from either side, which includes both stat raises and stat drops. Critical hits only calculate with the original stats from both sides. The next big difference between Stadium and Link Battles is how trapping moves work. These are like Wrap, Clamp, and Fire Spin. In a Link battle, if one Pokémon is trapped by a move and then switches on the next turn, the incoming Pokémon gets trapped, which means that it won't get to attack so long as the trapping move continues. But in Stadium, switching ends the continuation of the attack, and then the new Pokémon that switches in won't immediately be trapped by the ongoing attack. But in only Link battles, the Pokémon using a trapping move is forced to keep using it if they don't switch until the attack ends. So you can stall out the power points by just keep switching, but then you're still trapped. So really, you just keep switching around and hope for a miss. Also, in Link battles and in Stadium, if an opponent is trapped by a move and then you switch while the attack should be ongoing, the opponent will still be unable to attack your newly switched in Pokémon that turn, even though you didn't even hit them on this turn. So trapping moves can be used as a pivot in both games. And lastly, the way that each of these handles power points is different. In Link Battles, the initial attack and all subsequent turns of the continuation are a single power point. But in Stadium, every turn of the move is a power point spent. Now, some other differences between Stadium and Red, Blue, Yellow is that Stadium fixes a lot of the glitches that are in Red, Blue, Yellow. Counter is the first move that gets fixed. In both games, and in Gen 1 as a whole, Counter only returns damage on fighting and normal moves. In future generations, this is changed to return damage on all physical attacks. But in Gen 1, it's just fighting and normal attacks. In Link Battles, damage values are stored until overwritten by another attack. If you were to get hit by a normal attack on one turn, and then on the next turn they choose to switch, and you use counter on this turn that they switch on, because that value is stored until it is overwritten, you will return the damage from the normal attack that you had just taken the turn before. So you can use counter in niche situations. Also, counter is a move that when used in this way can desync a link battle. On one side it may say that counter did its damage, and on the other side it may say that the move has failed. Stadium fixes all of this, and also net battle platforms mod in that desyncs turn into move fails. But also, counter used in this way doesn't always desync the battle. 
Another glitch that Stadium fixes is Toxic plus Leech Seed. In Red, Blue, Yellow, Leech Seed ticks increase the Toxic Poison counter, if they're both on the same Pokémon together. That might be useful in some way, but really I feel like Gen 1 is just way too fast for this glitch to be exploited in any meaningful way. Another bizarre glitch that Stadium fixes is that if you are underground from Dig or up in the air from Fly, being interrupted by Paralysis or hitting yourself in Confusion will continue to maintain that partially invulnerable state, and you can even use other moves and remain invulnerable afterwards. The last and most important change between Stadium and Red, Blue, Yellow is how the game handles stat drops. So Stadium fixes all of this mess I'm about to explain. Now in Red, Blue, Yellow, if you get a burn or paralysis, if during the opponent's attack they use a move that changes stats in any way for either side, like agility, or sword stance, or even a secondary effect, like how Psychic has a chance to reduce special, then the speed reduction of the paralysis will be applied yet again, or the attack reduction from burn will be applied again if you're burned. And basically that would happen if the opponent uses a stat changing move on their turn while you have a paralysis or burn. But the most important difference between Stadium and Link Battles is the team preview. In Link Battles, you don't know what's waiting in the back of an opponent's team until it comes out. And playing with Team Preview will change what kind of predictions and risks that you're able to take. It's a really big deal, so pay attention to what your opponent has if you're playing with Team Preview. Okay, so now let's talk about the Pokémon. We'll start with the best ones first, and then at the end we'll talk about the ones that are only niche and fringe playable. Arguably, the number one best Pokémon in all of Gen 1 is Snorlax. Snorlax is maybe even better than Mewtwo in Ubers, actually. Stab Body Slam is huge. Stab means same type attack bonus for anyone who doesn't know. If a Pokémon uses a move that has the same type as them, then that attack will be 50% stronger. So Body Slam is 85 power, and with the Stab it'll have a little over 120 power. But what also makes Body Slam good is that it has a 30% chance to paralyze. And in Gen 1, normal types cannot be paralyzed by Body Slam. So that's a rather peculiar interaction that makes normal types attractive as switch-ins to each other. And Snorlax is the fattest fatty in Gen 1. It's really good at trading hits and returning with a really strong Body Slam. Now there's a few different move sets that are popular on Snorlax. The All Attacks set goes something like Body Slam, Earthquake, Blizzard, and then either Hyper Beam or Self Destruct. Now that Self Destruct or Hyper Beam will get the Stab bonus, and Self Destruct halves the defense of the opponent during damage calculation. It can be devastating if Snorlax takes something down and then Self Destructs to trade with another thing, but also Hyper Beam in Red, Blue, Yellow doesn't recharge if the target gets knocked out by it. So both are really strong. Self-Destruct is better in my opinion because you will more often use the move in this slot when you'll only get one last chance to attack before you go down. And Self-Destruct can almost guarantee that Snorlax always at least trades even with something. Earthquake is good for being able to hit Gengar and also scouting for counter. So if you think the opponent might have counter, you can throw Earthquake first because counter only returns damage on normal and fighting type attacks in Gen 1 and then Blizzard is a really good coverage move. It hits a lot of weaknesses, as well as having a chance to freeze, and the damage works out sometimes against different Pokémon that you can throw one Blizzard and it won't change the number of attacks it takes to knock something out. So you might as well take that chance for a freeze, but also Blizzard has 90 accuracy, so that chance for a freeze comes with a chance to miss. So you'll have to decide for yourself if that chance for a freeze is worth it or not. Blizzard is also really valuable versus other Snorlax movesets that use Reflect. So if an enemy Snorlax uses Reflect, which halves the damage of physical attacks, then it's nice to have a special move that you can still throw at it. Which brings us to the Reflect Snorlax moveset, which usually goes something like Reflect, Body Slam, Ice Beam, and Rest. 
Now this moveset is ideal for versus other Snorlax and against physical attackers like Tauros. And Ice Beam instead of Blizzard, because Blizzard only has 8 power points, and Ice Beam has a lot more. Which is important because this moveset is trying to keep Snorlax around for a long time. You're looking to get comfortable and spam Ice Beam, fishing for a freeze, or spam Body Slam against Chansey as you drain all of their soft boiled power points. And a crit from Snorlax Body Slam does around 80% health to Chansey. So Chansey basically has to spam heal on the back foot against Snorlax. Also, rest is very viable in Gen 1. There are many opportunities to rest and wake up just fine. Rest is always exactly two attacks. And if the enemy is paralyzed, there's a good chance that at least one of those turns is free. But also, if you have a Reflect Up versus another Snorlax, then they can't even do enough damage without crits to you to KO you before you wake up. Snorlax can also rest in front of Chansey without much fear. If a Chansey wants to stay in versus a resting Snorlax, it's probably just wasting its power points unless they're fishing for a freeze or if they have Sing. Because Chansey is faster than Snorlax and can potentially just put it back to sleep after it wakes up. But rest is usually really safe. It's easy enough to find an opportunity to rest with a bulky Pokemon in Gen 1. And it goes really well with Reflect. The third most common moveset on Snorlax goes Amnesia, Blizzard, Rest, and then either Body Slam, Reflect, or Earthquake. So Amnesia raises your special stat, and Blizzard is a special attack. And that special stat in Gen 1 is for both special attack and special defense. Both of those are consolidated into a single stat in this game. And by spamming Amnesia, you get more damage on Blizzard and more defense against special attacks at the same time. And that pairs nicely with Reflect, which will also reduce your physical damage. And then it also synergizes with Rest, because if you're boosting defenses, then you probably can take a couple of hits no problem while you're asleep. So Blizzard on Amnesia, instead of Ice Beam for more damage, but you could still use Ice Beam instead if you like having more power points. Body Slam is nice to still have as a strong physical move in your back pocket, because the special attackers might just take more damage from the Body Slam even though you've boosted your special. Because Snorlax has a very low base special stat, Snorlax base special is only 65. When it comes to base stats, anything over 100 is exceptional, and anything around 50 is bargain bin low. But also, high special Pokémon tend to have low defense, so having a physical move can still be really good. It all just really depends. This game is very heavily matchup dependent. And if you really wanted to hit Gengar, you could run Earthquake instead of Body Slam as your one physical move. And Earthquake will also circumvent Counter, because countering Snorlax Body Slam will just KO it. 100% for sure from Chansey at least because Counter's return damage goes off of the HP that your Pokémon would have lost, and Chansey is all HP and no defense. So that's Snorlax, he's everything in Gen 1. It's the best at trading hits, it can set up Amnesia, or can wall up and spam Ice Beam. And Self-Destruct is a great ace in the hole to have if you're on the back foot. Or if you already got a lead, then Snorlax can effectively get two for one. But watch out for the opponent switching in with something like Gengar if it's obvious that you're going to use Self-Destruct. Because Ghosts are immune to normal type attacks. Or switching into a Rock type versus a Self-Destruct is a good prediction. Pokémon like Rhydon and Golem only lose around 30% of their health from a Snorlax Self-Destruct. Now some good ways to deal with the Snorlax. First, Snorlax takes pretty big damage from stab Psychic Attacks but you also shouldn't want to switch in your Alakazam or Starmie into that Body Slam. And Snorlax usually has Blizzard for Executor. But if Snorlax uses Rest, and then if it didn't raise its special with Amnesia, then an Alakazam can force it out by threatening to KO it before it wakes up. Or switching into a Trapper that's faster than Snorlax also has the potential to force it out, but you have to be careful, because whenever you switch anything into Snorlax, you take the risk of getting it paralyzed by Body Slam. Cloyster is a good switch in versus Snorlax. With high defense, it can take a hit no problem, and then use Clamp, which will force it out. And then the trapping move will also give you a free switch, 
so you can effectively reset the position. And anything bulky with a sleep move is really good versus Snorlax. You can just keep putting it back to sleep over and over again forever so long as you're not paralyzed. And this will force them to switch out or give up their Snorlax. And if your sleeper has another status move, maybe you could paralyze something else on top of that. Reflect Snorlax is also really effective against a not Reflect Snorlax. If you have Reflect and they don't, they'll never KO you without a self-destruct. And even then, Reflect has that damage too. Next up is Tauros. Now, Snorlax is best boy, but Tauros is actually the main character. Tauros is incredibly strong. It's very hard to argue for going without one in Gen 1. So the usual Tauros moveset goes Body Slam, Earthquake, Blizzard, and Hyper Beam. Stab Body Slam is Tauros' best neutral attack, and Earthquake is for Gengar, and Blizzard is another great coverage move that hits weakness on a variety of things. And Blizzard is also great to have when Snorlax puts up his Reflect. But also, sometimes throwing one Blizzard doesn't change the number of attacks it takes to take something down, so then you could just throw one Blizzard for a chance to freeze. Hyper Beam is enormous on Tauros, getting the stab bonus, and Tauros also has a really high attack to put behind it. Hyper Beam from Tauros has a chance to one-hit KO some things from full, and it does like 80 or 90% on a lot of other things. So Tauros is best used as an anchor, it's commonly saved as the very last Pokemon on your team, and then it cleans up all of your opponent's weakened Pokemon. Now remember that Hyper Beam doesn't force a recharge in Link battles if it gets a KO or if it misses. So that makes this job super easy for Tauros. The convention is to make sure that you never, ever, not never, leave an opportunity for your Tauros to get paralyzed, or else you won't be able to sweep with it at the end of the game. Now the counterplay to Tauros is almost non-existent. Nothing really wants to switch into Body Slam from Tauros because of the 30% chance it has to paralyze. Now a unique quirk about Body Slam in Gen 1 is that it cannot paralyze normal types. So Snorlax can almost switch into Tauros, except Tauros is faster and Body Slam still does a good chunk to Snorlax. And then Snorlax very quickly gets chipped into range of Hyper Beam. And so Snorlax probably gets to just do one attack before it goes down if it's switched into a Body Slam. But if Snorlax starts that fight fresh, it can start with a Reflect and probably have time to get in a hit and then also use Rest. But also Tauros has a high crit rate and crits ignore Reflect. So that's the risk you'll have to take with Reflect. But Tauros also has Blizzard, so that if you spent a turn on Reflect it might not even matter but at least it will reduce the damage of Hyper Beam. Now, Snorlax could have self-destruct, but that doesn't KO Tauros from full. But there is that option if Tauros already had any damage on it. Another Pokémon that almost checks Tauros is Cloyster. Now, Cloyster has super high defense, so it can take like 5 Body Slams from Tauros. But it feels really bad to switch in and then just get paralyzed by the Body Slam. But if Cloyster doesn't get paralyzed by the Body Slam, then it has a Stab Blizzard that does almost 50% to Tauros. And if Cloyster does get paralyzed, then it's pretty much done for. But it does come with Explosion. And Cloyster might as well explode if it gets paralyzed because then it can't serve the role that it has on your team, which I will explain later when we get to Cloyster. But Tauros could even learn Thunderbolt, which is super effective and does almost 50% back to Cloyster. So Cloyster may look like a really attractive switch in against Tauros, but it also kind of isn't. And in Stadium, where Hyper Beam always forces a recharge, Thunderbolt might just be a better move to have instead of Hyper Beam anyway. So there's just not really anything that likes to switch into Tauros. Now anything that could have Thunder Wave will most certainly try to paralyze Tauros. So don't challenge any situation that could get your Tauros paralyzed. But if they're low enough that a single hit takes them out, or if they themselves are paralyzed, then that will be an opportunity that comes with that risk. And you'll have to decide if that's a risk that you're willing to take in that given situation. You would think that Rhydon or Golem would be a good switch in on Tauros if you predict a Hyper Beam, because you'll resist it and then they've got to recharge after. But both of them are slower than Tauros, 
and their Big Stab Earthquake only does about 50% to Tauros. And then Tauros Blizzard does about 65% back. And since Tauros is faster, you pretty much only get one chance to attack them before you get knocked out. And that Blizzard also has a chance to crit, and so you could actually just get nothing for switching in one of your rock types on Tauros. And then Tauros vs. Tauros is all about trying to chip the other one into hyperbeam range, and then hope that you win the speed tie. But switching yours into theirs means that you'll start that mirror match with a deficit, so you'll have to throw your hyperbeam early and just pray for a crit. Now Gengar can switch into Tauros just fine, as it has immunity to normal type attacks, like Body Slam and Hyper Beam. But Gengar and Tauros are actually tied in speed, so what you shoot for after that is very risky. Gengar can throw Hypnosis, which has a 60% chance to sleep Tauros, and Tauros has Earthquake, which does like 90% to Gengar. And if it crits, then Gengar is just gone in one hit. So it's a coin flip for who goes first. So Gengar vs. Tauros is very desperate for Gengar. But a big brain play would be to switch Gengar in on Tauros, take nothing from Body Slam because ghosts are immune to normal type attacks, and then while expecting Earthquake, switch to a flying type like Zapdos, who will take nothing from Earthquake because flying is immune to ground type attacks. And then you can threaten it with Thunder Wave if it's Zapdos, or at least you can get in your flyer without taking any damage. The best way to deal with Tauros is actually to hope that they switch it in prematurely, or if you can get them to switch their Tauros into a status move, or if you can start it at a deficit. Another way that Tauros gets used is if you put an enemy to sleep, then you can immediately switch to your Tauros to beat on them while they're asleep. And because nothing really wants to switch into Tauros, it forces them to make a difficult choice between losing their sleeping Pokémon or switching into that Body Slam. So Tauros is huge in Gen 1. Don't go without it, and don't let it sweep your team either. You might just even have something with Thunder Wave in the back for Tauros at the end of the game, like Alakazam or Starmie, but you can never bring them in against anything else before that because if they get paralyzed, or if they're not at full health, then they might not be able to paralyze the enemy Tauros. Sometimes it's just better to let Tauros get the KO, and then bring in your next thing right after so it can start fresh, instead of switching into its body slam. And they call that a revenge KO. A Revenge KO is when one of your Pokémon gets KO'd, and then the next thing you bring out KO's the thing that they just had out there. Okay, so now the last of the three Super S-tier Pokémon in Gen 1 is Chansey. Now Chansey is super good because it has massive HP, together with a really high special stat. And it has access to Soft Boiled, which recovers 50% of your max health, which is a lot on Chansey. Chansey also has this incredibly low defense stat. When 50 is considered low, Chansey has a base stat of 5. But its massive HP still allows it to take one physical hit before it goes down. Chansey has to be very, very weary of physical attackers. But Chansey's really high special stat allows it to very effectively wall out special attackers, and gives it good special damage of its own. The first and most common moveset on Chansey goes Ice Beam, Thunderbolt, Thunder Wave, and Soft Boiled. Ice Beam and Thunderbolt together give you great coverage, allowing you to hit weaknesses on a large variety of targets. Ice Beam instead of Blizzard, usually because Ice Beam has more power points and doesn't miss. And when walling against special attackers, you can just keep healing back up and fish for freezes with that Ice Beam. Or, you could paralyze them first with that Thunder Wave if you think that you can outdamage them. Thunderbolt puts a lot of pressure on Starmie, but any of those strong Psychic types can force Chansey out by using Psychic over and over again. Critical hits are really common in this game, but also Psychic has a chance to reduce the target's special stat, so it'll take more damage from the next one. And when Chansey gets put on the back foot against a Psychic spam, it usually has to switch out especially after its special drops. Instead of Thunderbolt, Seismic Toss is also great. It has even more power points than Thunderbolt, and the damage pressures Alakazam more than Ice Beam or Thunderbolt does, because Alakazam actually has a really high special stat. And you can still beat Starmie without Thunderbolt just fine. 
I prefer to fish for Freezes versus Alakazam, or another Chansey, or if the Alakazam is already paralyzed, then Seismic Toss is a lot better. I don't like to spam Ice Beam on Starmie because Starmie resists it, and it doesn't do enough damage to make it spend turns using Recover. You could also run Sing on Chansey instead of Thunder Wave, because Sleep in Gen 1 can be a death sentence. It also allows Chansey to force out Snorlax because Chansey is faster. And because Pokémon don't attack in the same turn that they wake up, Sing on Chansey can prevent Snorlax from ever even having a turn. Which is huge, because Snorlax is a common switch-in against Chansey. And sleeping it can make your opponent immediately regret that. Sing is also a great counterplay to Amnesia. You see it on Snorlax, and you also see Amnesia on Slowbro. Chansey has no problem switching into a special boosted attack. And then being faster than both of those, Chansey can sing them to sleep, and then that forces them to switch, or else Chansey will heal back up, and then Seismic toss it until it wakes up, and then put it right back to sleep because Chansey is just faster. Now, because of the sleep clause, just be very mindful of which Pokémon you choose to sing at. And then this is the moveset that I like to play on Chansey. Ice Beam, Seismic toss, Sing, and Soft Boil. You could also switch something out for Reflect, Reflect will allow Chansey to effectively wall everything, except that crits ignore Reflect, and crit rates are really high in Gen 1. So that comes with the territory. But with a Reflect up, Chansey can cause a lot of trouble for an unprepared opponent. But Reflect Chansey can also still get forced out by a strong Psychic type. Now having Reflect means that Chansey is also missing something else. So your own Chansey can also stall out a Reflect Chansey and waste all of its power points. Also, paralyzing Reflect Chansey makes it very hard for it to set up again if it has to switch out. Chansey can also have Light Screen, then it can super extra wall out special attackers, and be even safer against Amnesia. But every move comes at the cost of not having another move. It's a given to have Soft Boil, and always bring at least one status move. And then, having two attacks is optimal so that you don't run out of power points, but if you had to run just one attack to fit another move, then Seismic Toss is usually the best one because it has the most power points, and gives you the most bang for your buck. Chansey also has access to Counter, and Counter is based on the HP that you would lose from the attack, and because Chansey is all HP and no defense, Counter on Chansey will 100% slay Snorlax from full by countering its Body Slam. It's absolutely hilarious, but having counter also comes at the cost of not having another move. And if they discover that you have counter before it lands, then you've wasted a move slot. And sometimes they check for counter by giving you an earthquake first. And sometimes Snorlax uses reflect first before it attacks Chansey. So if you run counter, just be careful not to expose it before you actually get to pull it off. So all of the top three triple S tier Pokemon are all normal types. And the next three top tier Pokémon just below them are all Psychic type, and that's Alakazam, Starmie, and Executor. I would argue that Alakazam is the best of these three, so I'll start there. Now Alakazam has incredible speed, outspeeding just about every other viable Pokémon in Gen 1. And it has Thunder Wave, and a recovery move, and a very powerful stab Psychic attack. Every good Alakazam usually has those three moves, and then the last one is either Reflect or Seismic Toss. Seismic Toss allows Alakazam to pressure out other Psychic types that would resist its attack. And Reflect is a way that Alakazam can become a wall versus physical attackers like Snorlax and Tauros. But it's also counterplay to Explosion. A common matchup is Alakazam versus Executor, and knowing that it wants to explode on you, Putting up a Reflect can force it to switch, or if they explode into the Reflect, then they can lose their Pokémon for nothing. But both of these options are good. You'll just have to decide for yourself what you value more. And Alakazam is a great lead, too. Being faster than just about everything, with the Paralysis move, is a great open. A lot of players like to open with a Sleep move, and Alakazam can trade a Paralysis with a Sleep. Or, since it's faster, you could get a Paralysis first, and then they don't even attack because they're paralyzed and they can't move on that turn. So if you're lucky, sometimes you get the Paralysis for free. 
Also, you can probably find an opportunity to wake up your Alakazam later. I would either switch it out right away after it falls to sleep, or take one chance at waking it up before switching. It's risky though, because they might right away switch to Tauros if your Alakazam is asleep. Also, none of the commonly used sleep moves have 100% accuracy. And, something to note about Paralysis leads is that a faster Pokémon with 100% accuracy Thunder Wave will put the opponent's sleep lead into a position of first rolling for their Paralysis check, and then for the accuracy of their move. So Alakazam could also just get lucky and beat them down before they even land a sleep move. Starmie vs Alakazam is also almost a mirror match. You'll both want to paralyze each other, and then you both also have recover. And then if Alakazam has Seismic Toss, that puts more pressure on Starmie. But Starmie has moves with neutral damage and crit chance. But then Alakazam is also faster, so it gets to go first, which allows you to be a little more aggressive under Paralysis. Now, with Alakazam vs Chansey, first you want to paralyze the Chansey, and then spam Psychic, hoping to get crits and to reduce Chansey's special stat, which will force it out. If any of these Pokémon have a heal move, like Recover or Soft Boiled, and they get low enough and are forced out, then it will be very difficult for them to later find an opportunity to come back in, as they would have to take a hit to switch in. I would look to switch in something that's low like that, on an opponent that's paralyzed or sleeping, and hope to get my recover off before getting hit. Because sometimes your Chansey will be forced out as its special gets dropped, but then it's also paralyzed and also low, and so maybe you'll be desperate and be looking for a situation like that to recover later. Or even better, if you're looking for an opportunity to bring something in. If an opponent that has a recovery move is paralyzed, and you predict that they're going to use that recovery move on this turn, then you could switch to your Pokémon and know that they're going to try to recover, but they might get paralyzed on one turn, and so then you can both try to use your recovery move on the next turn. So that situation might buy you enough turns to switch and then also get to use your recover before you get hit. Again, Alakazam vs Executor is really common. Alakazam wants to paralyze Executor and then just chip it down and recover when you need to. Then the Executor will probably have a sleep move and maybe have a paralysis move. But if the Alakazam is already paralyzed or something on your team is already asleep, then that won't affect you. Now Executor usually has Explosion, but if you've got Reflect, you should throw that up as soon as you can. Or if you don't, you could switch to something that doesn't get hurt by Explosion, like Gengar or Rhydon, on the turn that you think they might use it, which is usually when Executor is about half health or lower. Also, Alakazam's first instinct is to just paralyze everything, but don't get baited. A common trick is that when Alakazam is pressuring Chansey, after the Chansey special stat drops, they'll switch Chansey for something that resists the Psychic, and then go right back to Chansey, hoping that you'll waste a turn throwing Thunder Wave at their returning Chansey. Starmie is very similar to Alakazam. It also has Thunder Wave, and it also has Recover. Usually, Starmie comes with those two moves, and then two attacking moves. Psychic is good versus Chansey and Snorlax, and Surf is the other same type attack that Starmie gets stab on, and it's good neutral damage on Alakazam. Thunderbolt is also good versus other Starmie, and there are also a good number of things that it can find weakness on. And then Blizzard or Ice Beam is great, as it can hit weaknesses on lots of stuff, but then it also gives you the ability to fish for freezes against walls. Starmie is also a fantastic lead. It's a bit slower than Alakazam, but it's still faster than a lot of other fast Pokémon, like Gengar and Tauros, which is very relevant. Starmie also has more defense than Alakazam, which allows it to better tango with physical attackers like Snorlax and Tauros. And it can also learn Reflect. It's just really hard dropping a move for Reflect, though. Every move comes at the cost of not having another move. With Starmie, I would strongly recommend Thunder Wave and Recover for sure, so taking Reflect will probably come at the cost of only having one attack. If you did want to take Reflect on Starmie, I would probably go with Psychic as my one attack, and just don't put it against any of the other Psychic types. 
Starmie, Alakazam, and Chansey all serve very similar roles in Gen 1, but it's very common to have two of them in case one of them gets put to sleep, or even all three. These three Pokémon have very high utility and are self-sufficient, and have the potential to just 1v1 a lot of stuff. Especially if you get lucky, these Pokémon go crazy when they've got good luck. So the last of the tippity top tiers is the Eggman. Executor could be a lead, but it's much better in the back of your team saved as a switch in for things that you need to put to sleep. And Executor is also really bulky, so it can take a few hits. It's really good as a switch in because it can also take hits just fine. Executor pretty much always has Psychic, and then Sleep Powder or Stun Spore, or both Sleep Powder and Stun Spore. And then Explosion is a really nice ace in the hole. Just be weary of a potential Gengar or Rhydon switch into your Explosion. Double Edge could also be really nice if you wanted a physical attack to hit Alakazam or Chansey with, and Mega Drain surprisingly finds a lot of use. It only has 40 power, but it absolutely melts Rhydon and Golem because it's times 4 weakness and stab. And then it takes a good chunk out of Starmie, and it heals you at the same time. If Starmie doesn't have Blizzard or Ice Beam, then Executor with Mega Drain will put it in check. But if Starmie does have Blizzard or Ice Beam, you really don't want your Executor to stay in against that. But if that Starmie with Blizzard is already paralyzed, and it's got some missing health, then because Mega Drain heals you, Executor can keep that weakened Starmie on the back foot until it goes down or switches out. So it all just kind of depends. On my Executor, I like to go with Psychic, Sleep Powder, Mega Drain, and Explosion. If you've already got a Paralysis on an enemy Pokémon, then it's highly likely that they'll switch into that to block your Sleep move. So Alakazam, Starmie, and Chansey like to come in on Executor because those three all usually paralyze each other at some point in the early game. And then because they'll come looking to paralyze Executor as well. And then Chansey and Starmie are likely to have Ice moves, so the switch-ins against Executor are fairly predictable. Basically, Executor's role is to switch in and put something to sleep. Then it wants to get out or look for an opportunity to get more value by hitting that Pokémon while it's asleep, or spreading paralysis to a different Pokémon, or trade with another Pokémon later using Explosion. But don't be too hasty with that Explosion. Be wary of the opponent predicting it and switching into something like Gengar or Rhydon or maybe they don't switch at all. So definitely don't waste your explosion on the one you just put to sleep. And then if the opponent has something that's low on HP, or something that's frozen, they might try to waste your explosion on that. So be patient about using explosion. There's a lot of times when you just keep using Psychic until the sleeping Pokémon goes down. Just don't get baited, and look for opportunities with Executor. It also trades hits nicely with a lot of things because of how bulky it is, and rest is even viable on Executor, especially if the opponent is paralyzed. It takes Alakazam at least four turns to take down Executor, and if it's paralyzed, then you can rest no problem in front of Alakazam. Executor could also rest in front of Starmie or Chansey if they didn't have an ice move. But don't take that risk if you don't know. Gen 1 battles are usually quite lengthy, getting up to over 100 turns on the regular, and being patient is the key to victory. And scouting out and keeping track of what moves your opponent's Pokémon know is very important and allows you to exploit which moves that they're missing. For example, if you know that a Chansey doesn't have Thunder Wave, then it has no chance against Alakazam. Or, if it doesn't have Thunderbolt, then Starmie can come in on it. Or, if Snorlax doesn't have Earthquake, then it can't hurt Gengar. So pay attention, and try your best to figure out what form moves the opponents have, so that you can try to call them out on it. So the next lot are not in the same echelon of the previous six, but they are all still very good, and each have their own roles to play. Zapdos is the first one that I want to talk about. It's super strong, and it functions well as a mixed attacker, having both a strong special attack, like Stab Thunderbolt, and also having a strong physical attack with Stab Drill Pet. I would prefer using Thunderbolt over Thunder because of the better accuracy, but I do see Thunder sometimes on Zapdos. 
and sometimes that thunder misses and you get heavily punished for using thunder instead of thunderbolt. Thunder Wave is also really good, giving you the ability to paralyze things. And then Agility is amazing on Zapdos, because you can get your speed back after getting paralyzed. So you can still go first after getting paralyzed. And then Rest is also viable on Zapdos. Zapdos is surprisingly bulky, and it can usually find an opportunity to use Rest. I would prefer to go with this moveset on Zapdos. Thunderbolt, Thunder Wave, Drill Peck, and Agility. Gengar is a solid lead, and it has great utility, even in the back, as a switch-in against normal type attacks. Gengar really enjoys outspeeding other Pokémon with sleep moves. Hypnosis only has 60% accuracy though, so it's still a coin flip even though you go first. But Gengar is also slower than the likes of Alakazam and Starmie, which makes shooting for sleep on them very risky. But basically, everything Gengar wants to do is high risk. The Pokémon it likes to switch in also threaten it with Earthquake, and Gengar can pretty much only take one hit before it goes down. Explosion is also really nice on Gengar. If you lead with Gengar and they start with Alakazam, you could also just immediately explode, hoping to survive the Psychic Attack. And Gengar usually comes with Nightshade, which goes nice with Hypnosis. And Nightshade usually instead of Seismic Toss because Seismic Toss is counterable, and Nightshade isn't. Also, exact HP damaging moves are not blocked by immunities. So for example, even though Ghost is immune to fighting attacks, Seismic Toss will still hit a Ghost. Gengar usually goes Hypnosis, Nightshade, Explosion, and then one choice of an attacking move. Thunderbolt is the most common because it can hit a lot of weaknesses, although Psychic is a good choice too. And Counter is something truly special on Gengar, but only in Link battles because of the way it stores damage values. So what you do is after a Pokémon of yours went down by a normal or fighting attack, bring in Gengar behind them, and Counter will calculate with that previously used normal or fighting move, but only if that value doesn't get overwritten first. So if they hit you with anything that turn, then your Counter will do nothing. But if you predict a switch, then you can surprise them with a really big counter. And all of Gengar is pretty much high risk, high reward. And then if you think that you can't get any more value out of it, then you'll explode. But again, be very weary of wasting explosion. Good players will expect you to explode when you're low or paralyzed. Also, Gengar can learn Confuse Ray. Which, if you throw confusion on something that's already also paralyzed, then you might be able to deny them from using their recovery moves for a couple of turns so that you can finish them off. Confuse Ray is high risk on Gengar though, because of how fragile it is. And it feels really bad to throw Confuse Ray and then still go down in one hit anyway. Okay, so Jinx is another great sleep lead. It's not as fast as Gengar, but it has a more accurate sleep move. Gengar's Hypnosis is only 60% accurate, but Jinx's Lovely Kiss is 75% accurate. Jinx is probably the most consistent sleep lead. It can easily stay in against Alakazam and Starmie, even after getting paralyzed, and Jinx can also usually use Rest in front of special attackers. Jinx also has access to Counter, which can catch people off guard. And then it's got two really strong stab moves, with Blizzard and Psychic. A good move set for Jinx is usually something like Lovely Kiss, Psychic, and Blizzard, and then either Rest or Counter. The last really common lead is Jolteon. Jolteon has Thunder Wave, and Thunderbolt or Thunder, but honestly Thunderbolt is better. And then Jolteon has some choice coverage moves, like Pin Missile can do 50% to Executor, and Double Kick is super effective on Chansey. 
In Pokémon Stadium, Focus Energy actually works like it's supposed to, and it makes Jolteon very dangerous, basically giving it all guaranteed critical hits. But in Link Battles, it's a useless move. Also in Stadium, Substitute actually blocks status moves. So Jolteon gets way stronger in Stadium, and gets way more options. Jolteon is also faster than Tauros, and can threaten it with Thunder Wave, and still have big damage to threaten other things with. Jolteon's biggest drawback is that it gets blocked by Golem and Rhydon. You might think that Double Kick will do something to them because Rock is weak to fighting, but don't do it, just switch. Double Kick will basically do nothing to them, and they'll one-hit you with that Stab Earthquake. Jolteon is great to pair with something that likes to switch in against those ground types. Executor is the high tier choice, but something exotic with flying like Gyarados can be good too. Just also remember that those guys will have Rock Slide, and that does big damage to flying types. Okay, so now let's talk about those ground types. So Rhydon and Golem are both good and serve a similar role. They come in on electric types and just completely invalidate them. Except know that Raichu can learn Surf, and that will one-shot any ground type. And then Rhydon can also learn Surf, so it can one-shot other ground types. But Golem is faster than Rhydon, and its Earthquake does about 50% to Rhydon. So just be aware of what end of the stick you've got. Now Golem can learn Explosion, and Rhydon cannot. Leer is also an interesting option that Rhydon has, as it can reduce back down the defense boost of a Reflect. Rhydon is generally better than Golem, it has a higher stat total, and is more versatile. However, Golem does have Explosion. Rhydon usually goes Earthquake, Rock Slide, Surf, and then the last move could be Substitute, Leer, or even Body Slam. Substitute is nice when you're expecting your opponent to switch. Or, if Rhydon is in against an opponent that's paralyzed, Rhydon will be faster. And you can avoid getting hit by a weakness move and hope that they get fully paralyzed on a turn or two. And Body Slam is great for hoping to paralyze whatever will switch into Rhydon. And Rhydon can also learn Blizzard. And this is interesting because Executor is a really common switch in against Rhydon, and if you predict their switch, and you throw Blizzard, then you can throw a super effective Blizzard against Executor, and also hope for that 10% freeze. Golem basically uses the same moveset, but also comes with Explosion. Golem's moveset goes like Rock Slide, Earthquake, Body Slam, and Explosion. I really like playing with a ground type in Gen 1, but you can get along just fine without one. But Zapdos can really cause you a lot of grief sometimes, and it's just really nice to always have that ground type that can just block it. And Golem can also learn Fire Blast, if you wanted a super effective move to throw whenever you expect an Executor to switch in on it. Now I really like Cloyster. You'll see it a lot in high level play. Cloyster has a huge base stat total, and its defense is absolutely massive. And it also outspeeds all of the slow Pokémon, like Executor, Chansey, and Snorlax. And this is very relevant for what you want to get out of it. So Cloyster's signature attack is Clamp. It's a 75 accuracy water type trapping move with a decent power that also gets stabbed. And you can use trapping moves as a pivot, because the enemy won't be able to attack on the same turn that you switch if they're also trapped. And trapping moves can also become a win condition. If the entire enemy team is slower than Cloyster, then it can just clamp all of them into range of another attack that will finish them off, and effectively trap the whole rest of the opponent's team into submission. And if all of the opponent's Pokémon, which should be faster, are paralyzed, then nothing can really stop it. But remember, Clamp is only 75% accurate, so it will eventually miss. But if the enemy is also paralyzed, then there's a chance that it also just doesn't matter. Now you counterplay trapping moves by switching around until the move either misses or runs out of PP. And if you have an opportunity to attack the opponent's trapper, you'd preferably like to hit it with a paralysis or a sleep, which will completely end its parade. 
Cloyster also comes with a Big Juicy Stab Blizzard or Big Juicy Stab Surf and it usually has Explosion, which will allow Cloyster to still get some value if it gets paralyzed. Cloyster is also one of these almost checks to Tauros, like I mentioned earlier, but it's still very risky. And Cloyster is better as a switch into Snorlax, because being faster than Snorlax allows you to throw Clamp at it. Cloyster is great, but you basically can never let it stay in against anything that's faster than it, because they will straight away try to paralyze you. And Cloyster actually has a really low HP stat, so a special move does a big chunk to Cloyster. And Thunderbolts are everywhere in this meta. Thunderbolt from just about anything does about 50% to Cloyster, so use with caution. And then Tauros can also learn Thunderbolt. And Tauros is one of the Pokémon that you want Cloyster to come in and check, so it's just it's so risky, you just have to be careful. So the next Pokémon that I want to talk about is Slowbro, and Slowbro pretty much always runs this moveset. Surf, Rest, Thunder Wave, and Amnesia. So the plan is to come in on a Paralyzed Special Attacker or something that's asleep, and then use the spare time to raise your special with Amnesia so that you can one-hit just about everything else with Surf. Surf is the best move on Slowbro because it gets Stab on it, and there's too many popular picks resisting Psychic. Thunder Wave is also quite nice, as the opponent may desperately try to switch to something that can better stop Slowbro from setting up, and paralyzing it can prevent them from preventing you. And also, paralyzing the opponent helps you get through those rest turns better. Now the counterplay for Amnesia is to just keep attacking it until the Slowbro or the Snorlax has to rest and then switch into something that can kill it faster with a physical attack, or with a sleep move, because all of the sleepers will be faster than Snorlax and Slowbro. I really favor Sing on Chansey for this reason, and Chansey has a big special stat of its own, so it's not too much afraid of those boosted special attacks. And then you can sleep them over and over until they switch or go down. Executor is great for this too. It will resist Psychic or Surf from Slowbro, but it gets weaknessed by Blizzard, which Snorlax always has. And Slowbro could have Blizzard too, it's just not as common. Explosion is also a desperate way to end an Amnesia sleep, or any strong physical attack, like Hyper Beam if they're in range, because Amnesia only boosts special. So Amnesia boosters are still vulnerable to physical attacks, and none of them are particularly fast either, so they're all very exploitable. So now that we've talked about all of these solidly overused picks in the Gen 1 meta, all of the rest of the Pokémon that I'm going to talk about are fringe picks that can be viable on the right team, but they also have various flaws that prevent them from having the same level of consistency as all of the ones that I've already talked about. So if you'd like to skip past all of the fringe picks and get to team building, here's the timestamp for that. So let's move on to the first of the fringe picks. So first up, we got Lapras. Now Lapras is on the borderline of being grouped together with the rest of the good Pokémon that are in overused, and it has a lot of strengths. First, Lapras has really good base stats, notably a lot of HP, and it learns a lot of great moves. Lapras has quite a variety of tools to choose from, and it can even 1v1 a lot of the big bads in the Gen 1 meta but it struggles to do that unless it begins those 1v1s at full health. Lapras is also quite bulky, so it can make good use of rest too. Without Thunderbolt, there's no way that a Chansey can stop Lapras from using rest. And then Lapras also has a really strong Stab Blizzard, and Lapras doesn't mind switching into a Body Slam, but if it gets paralyzed by that Body Slam, then it's just basically done for. But rest will also remove the paralysis, so there's always the chance that you can get rid of it by resting. And Lapras is kind of afraid to actually do the job that you want it to do on your team, because Lapras needs full health to win all of those 1v1s, and you want to switch it into a body slam, and it doesn't mind switching into a body slam, but then it starts that interaction at a deficit, and then if it gets paralyzed, then it's not going to be able to do the job that you need it to do. The move that I think really makes Lapras stand out is Confuse Ray. 
If an opponent is already paralyzed, then Confuse Ray can be super annoying. With both a coin flip for paralysis and then another coin flip for confusion, it can make it really hard for your opponent to get a move in. And then it's also really easy to rest if your opponent is both paralyzed and confused. It's particularly a good move against opponents that want to spam recovery moves. Blocking them for a turn or two can be the end of that. Gengar can also learn Confuse Ray, but Lapras is far more durable than Gengar, so it's not as risky. Confuse Ray plus Body Slam is great for breaking down Chansey. I really like going something like this on Lapras. Blizzard, Body Slam, Confuse Ray, and Rest. Lapras is pretty good and you have to respect it, but sometimes it just gets paralyzed by a Body Slam and then you just wish it were anything else. Hypno is the other Pokémon on the borderline of being overused. It's pretty alright. It has Hypnosis, but Hypno isn't particularly fast, so it loses to other sleep bleeds. Also, Hypnosis only has 60 accuracy, compared to some other sleep moves that have 75 accuracy. It also wants to be like an Alakazam with Thunder Wave and Psychic, but it doesn't have nearly the same speed or special as Alakazam. And Hypno also doesn't learn Recover, so if you want a recovery move, then it has to be Rest. So Hypno has a lot of downsides, but where it shines is as a roll consolidation. It can kind of do some different things all at the same time, but not being the best at any of them. The first common move set on Hypno is Thunder Wave, Hypnosis, Psychic, and Seismic Toss. Hypno is very versatile, and you could always deviate from the norm and really catch your opponent off guard with Hypno but it also gets outclassed by the more common Pokémon that do each of its jobs better. Some of those things to catch people off guard is Counter. Hypno can learn Counter, and you might be able to cheese a victory with that. Hypno also learns a variety of good physical moves, like Body Slam, or Submission which hits weakness on Chansey, or Headbutt. So Headbutt has a 30% chance to flinch the opponent, and if you've already paralyzed them, then there's always that chance that they just don't get to play anymore. But you have to be faster than them for that to work, which is hard on Hypno, because they'll also probably paralyze you. So like you could do that to Snorlax, and Chansey sometimes. So Hypno is good at catching underprepared players off guard, but consolidating multiple roles into the same Pokémon could allow you to make room for another Pokémon that you're trying to fit on your team, and that's what Hypno is better used for. So, from here on down are all of the underused Pokémon that are only so good within their niche. The first one is Haunter, which is just a worse Gengar, obviously. But you might actually play with it if you liked Gengar so much that you'd want two of them on your team. Haunter has worse stats than Gengar, so if you played with both of them, Haunter would be more likely to focus on status moves paired with Nightshade. Probably Confuse Ray, maybe Explosion, Explosion on Haunter is not nothing, but it also isn't very strong either. It definitely won't KO anything from full. And then of course Haunter is even more fragile than Gengar, so it dies in one hit to a lot of things. Haunter is all about getting those statuses and hoping to be lucky so that they don't attack through them. Kadabra is the other Pokémon that you could run if you just really badly wanted another Alakazam. But Starmie is better than Kadabra, so you would be playing with a whole team that basically fills the same role. And then Hypno is probably better as a second discount Alakazam, but Kadabra has enough stats so that maybe it could be playable if you just wanted one more. Okay, so Articuno is kind of good. Articuno has great bulk, and it can trade hits with a lot of things. And Stab Blizzard is really strong. It also is bulky enough that it can probably find an opportunity to use Rest and be just fine. And it can learn Reflect, 
which could make it good against Tauros and Snorlax. The flying type allows you to switch in on Earthquake, but Articuno gets absolutely destroyed by a times 4 weakness to Rock Slide, so watch out for that one. If you switch Articuno into a Rock type and they predict it, then it's really bad. Articuno also has some other notable weaknesses. It's weak to Thunderbolt, which is everywhere, and it's weak to Fire, which is less common, but you'll see Fire Blasts here and there. Also, something that's notable in Gen 1 is that Fire type does not resist Ice. So Moltres has a weakness to Blizzard, instead of it being neutral damage like it is in future games. Articuno also has some good physical moves that it can use, like Double Edge or Hyper Beam, which allows it to function as a mixed attacker. And Agility can be good for if you get paralyzed. A good mixed attacker set on Articuno might go something like Blizzard, Double Edge, Hyper Beam, and Agility. Or a Reflect move set might go something like Reflect, Rest, Ice Beam, and Blizzard. You would like to have both Ice Beam and Blizzard on this set for the extra power points as you're hoping to keep it alive for a long time. But you could swap Blizzard out for a physical move but the power on it is really nice against things that it can really hurt. And against special walls, you can probably just stall them out and fish for a freeze anyway with Ice Beam, but you really could mix up the moveset to hedge your bets on any particular matchup, based on what your team needs to be stronger against. So the other legendary bird that gets underused is Moltres. Now Moltres is respectable, it's got great stats and a really strong stab fire blast. But what's special about Moltres is Fire Spin. Fire Spin is a trapping move, and it's fire type so Moltres gets stab on it. Now Moltres also has access to agility, which will definitely make it faster than everything else. And that can be a win condition. To fire spin everything on the opponent's team into range of a move that will finish it off. The Moltres set usually goes Agility, Fire Spin, Fire Blast, and Hyper Beam. Now, the struggle of trying to fire spin everything is that there are a lot of Pokemon that resist fire, and you'll probably run out of power points before you get there. And those guys with high special don't take too much from it either. So the counterplay to trapping moves again is to keep switching until it either misses or runs out of power points. And when you have an opportunity to attack, you'd like to throw a status move which will end the cycle. And sometimes trapping moves go the distance, but then other times it feels like you've got the game locked down and then you miss and get paralyzed and it's all over for you. The reason that trapping strategies aren't top tier is because of how inconsistent they are. But there is another Moltres set that you can try. It goes Fire Blast, Reflect, Rest, and Toxic. And the goal is to trade hits and 1v1 stuff. Moltres has some reasonable bulk, so Rest is viable, especially if you can put up Reflect. But also watch out for that times 4 weakness to Rock Slide. And Fire Attacks don't much hurt Rock types either. And then Starmie really likes to switch into Fire Blast. And the risk on that is that if Starmie gets burned by the Fire Blast, then it can't later be put to sleep or be paralyzed, which is a huge problem because Starmie will just recover all of its damage and still Thunder Wave your whole team. So now let's talk about the other wrappers and trappers that get underused. Dragonite is also considered a sort of legendary Pokemon too. Now Dragonite learns the trapping move Rap, which is a normal type, so it gets a stab bonus. Rap is also only 85% accurate, and Dragonite also can learn agility. And agility plus a trapping move can be a win condition. Also note that sometimes agility plus Rap on the same Pokemon might be banned. It's one of those things that some places play with it and some places play without but Rap is still good without agility because the rest of your team will try to paralyze the enemy team so that your trapper can clean up later. Now Dragonite being normal type means that it also gets stab on Hyper Beam, which is a really big deal. Dragonite itself can also learn Thunder Wave, so it can paralyze something it needs to before going on a wrapping spree. 
Dragonite also just has a really great move pool, but wrapping is what it's most known for in Gen 1. Blizzard is a great fourth move, as it can finish certain things off at higher ranges than Hyper Beam, so the wrap set pretty much goes Agility, Wrap, Blizzard, and Hyper Beam. Now Dragonite's time 4 weakness to Ice makes it really bad for playing to trade, but Dragonite does learn Reflect, and you could go with some kind of Rest plus Reflect set on Dragonite. It also learns a lot of great attacks of different types, so you could also use it as some sort of mixed attacker. But Wrapping probably is the best role that it can play on a team. The next notable trapper in the underused is Victory Bell. So Victory Bell has Wrap, and it also has Stun Spore and Sleep Powder. And it can learn Sword Stance, so it has a lot of great utility moves. And then it can also learn Hyper Beam. And Razor Leaf is a solid same type attack. And Razor Leaf also has a high crit chance, so it's really good. Victory Bell seems like a fantastic Pokemon at first glance but all of its moves are missing some accuracy and it's very inconsistent. But the standard Victory Bell goes Wrap, Razor Leaf, Stun Spore, and Sleep Powder. And it gets used as a lead that's just looking to spread status, but if the opportunity arises, then it can also become a win condition with Wrap. The Sword Stance Victory Bell usually looks something like Sword Stance, Hyper Beam, Razor Leaf, and Wrap and Sword Stance will also boost Rap's damage hilariously enough. I prefer to mix the styles a bit. I really like using Sleep Powder to start, and then use Sword Stance while the opponent is asleep. My Victory Bell moveset goes Sleep Powder, Sword Stance, Rap, and Hyper Beam. Now you always have to sacrifice something to fit another move in, but you could also go Stun Spore instead of Sleep Powder, or Razor Leaf instead of Rap. It's all up to you and what role you're trying to fit Victory Bell in. Is it a sword stancer? Is it a rapper? Is it a sleep lead? That's all up to you. So the next underused rapper that we got is Tentacruel. So Tentacruel actually has a decent base speed. With 100 base speed, it naturally outspeeds a lot of the other trappers and anything else that isn't notably fast. And a lot of the fast Pokemon end up getting paralyzed at some point over the course of the battle anyway, so Tentacruel's base speed is actually very significant. Tentacruel pretty much only ever gets used for Wrap though, and the best moveset it has for that is Wrap, Surf, Blizzard, and Hyper Beam. But Tentacruel can also learn some really cool moves like Sword Stance and Barrier. Barrier raises your defense by two stages, so it's kind of like Reflect, but in a different way. And it can learn Double Edge, although Hyper Beam is better unless you're playing on Stadium. In which case, use Double Edge. Hyper Beam just isn't the same on Stadium. And if you wanted a Sword Stance Tentacruel, then go something like Surf, Wrap, Sword Stance, and Hyper Beam. If you can find a setup opportunity, then Sword Stance Tentacruel can definitely carry. But without Sword Stance, Blizzard can hit weaknesses on some different things and KO stuff that's above the range of Surf and Hyper Beam sometimes. Okay, so next we got Onyx. Now Onyx is kind of neat. It consolidates the roles of being a Wrapper and a Rock Slash Ground type and it can also learn Explosion. Onyx also has a 70 base speed, which is actually really high for a rock type. Onyx is faster than Executor, but Onyx's trapping move is Bind with only 75% accuracy. And if you miss one at a lot of certain things, then Onyx just gets one shot. But the Onyx move set usually looks like Bind, Earthquake, Rock Slide, and Explosion. Now, Pinsir can also learn Bind, and it's also pure bug type, so it resists Earthquake and it resists Psychic, but it has weakness to Rock, but it will also be faster than all of the Rock types, 
so it just depends on the situation if Pinsir can stay in or not against a rock type. Pinsir most notably can learn Sword Stance, and a normal Pinsir moveset looks like Sword Stance, Slash, Hyper Beam, and then either Bind or Submission. Slash is great, as it gets past Reflect. Just remember that critical hits ignore stat changes, so you want to look at your high crit move as sort of a neutral damage kind of attack. And Bind can be a win condition together with Sword Stance, but Submission does a lot of damage to Chansey, and it's also super effective on other normal types like Tauros and Snorlax, but what it does to Chansey especially with no buffs, Submission from Pinsir will always do a little over 50% to Chansey. But you also take one fourth of that back as recoil damage, so is it really worth it? You have to decide that for yourself if you want to play Submission on Pinsir. Despite being a bug type that resists Psychic, Alakazam still hits Pinsir for over half of its health with a single Psychic. Okay, so Lickitung is actually really cool. It's got Sword Stance, and it's got Wrap, and Hyper Beam. But Lickitung is also a normal type, so it can get a boosted stab on Hyper Beam. I'm pretty sure that Lickitung is the only Gen 1 Pokemon that is normal type that can also learn all of these moves together. So the Lickitung moveset might go Sword Stance, Hyper Beam, and then Earthquake to hit Gengar, and Wrap for a win condition or Body Slam instead if you want a stab neutral attack. Now Lickitung only has 30 base speed, so it's actually slower than literally everything. And really its only chance to use the rap stuff is if the entire enemy team is paralyzed, so Body Slam is usually better. So Arbok is the last of the trapping Pokémon that I haven't talked about. First it can learn Wrap, and Glare, which gives it the ability to paralyze something. And just those two things alone together can give you a lot of value. But then it can also hit Gengar with Earthquake, and that's big value, because Wrap is a normal type move. And most of the things that know a trapping move only have a special move to hit Gengar with. And since Gengar is immune to normal type attacks, it really likes to come in against Wrap. And that Earthquake gives Arbok something that none of the other Rappers have. And then Arbok can also learn Hyper Beam, which fully completes the Wrap set. And then of course the strategy is to just chip things down into range and then finish them off with a strong move. So the next lot that I want to talk about are the Fire Spinners. We already talked about Moltres, but the next best Fire Spinner is Rapidash. Rapidash has a really good 105 base speed, making it faster than a lot of things. And that speed together with a trapping move can easily become a win condition. And Rapidash can also learn agility. So if it gets an opportunity to set up, then that's all she wrote. Rapidash would also have Fire Blast, of course, and then Hyper Beam or Body Slam. Or, if Agility is banned, you'll take both Body Slam and Hyper Beam. So Ninetales is kind of like Rapidash, but with a better special stat. But Ninetales can also learn Confused Ray, which gives it a little more utility. Ninetales usually goes Fire Blast, Fire Spin, Body Slammer Hyper Beam, and Confuse Ray. Now Flareon doesn't have near the same speed as Rapidash or Ninetales to be as successful with Fire Spin, but Fire Spin is still nice as a pivot move, and the potential of it being a win condition is still there. What Flareon trades for speed is power. It's got a really high attack stat, and it's got a pretty good special too, which can make it better at cleaning up late game if the table is set. The Flareon moveset goes Fire Blast, Body Slam, Hyper Beam, and Fire Spin.
So the last potential fire spinner is Charizard, but Charizard can learn Sword Stance as well. And it really doesn't even have room for Fire Spin. The Charizard moveset usually goes Sword Stance, Slash, Earthquake, and Hyper Beam. But you could probably swap Hyper Beam or Slash out for Fire Spin if you really wanted it. Especially in Stadium, where Hyper Beam is not as good. You just really want to maximize the value of that Sword Stance though. Just remember that critical hits ignore stat changes, so you want to look at your high crit move as sort of a neutral damage kind of attack. And fire moves are special moves, and there also aren't too many things in the meta that fire hits weakness on, and a lot more that resist it. So Charizard more often than not just even goes without taking a fire move. Okay, so the next lot that I want to talk about are the underused Pokémon that serve a similar role as the ones that are already better at that role in a higher tier. These are like bargain bin discount versions of the higher tiers, but they can still be quite viable because sometimes just having two of a thing is really good depending on your team comp. So the first of these that I want to talk about is Persian. Now Persian essentially functions as another Tauros, but with far less bulk. Now Persian pretty much gets 2 hit KO'd by just about everything, but what makes Persian unique is Slash, which will basically always crit. It's got like a 99% crit chance on Persian, and crits circumvent Reflect, so it can be very useful. Especially if an opponent throws up a Reflect and then rests, Persian can chop it down before it wakes up. The Persian moveset pretty much only ever goes Slash, Bubble Beam, Thunderbolt, and Hyper Beam. Slash is obvious, and Hyper Beam only has just a tiny bit more power than Slash. Slash has 70 power, doubled is 140, and Hyper Beam has 150 power. Persian will also get the stab bonus on both of those attacks, of course. Stab Slash is a really big deal for Persian, but be weary of using Hyper Beam when you don't need to, as Hyper Beam also only has 90 accuracy. Now, Bubble Beam has a times 4 weakness on the rock slash ground types. And then Thunderbolt is another really relevant coverage move that can hit Cloyster really hard, among other things. Persian is also a little bit faster than Tauros, and that is worth remembering. If an enemy Tauros gets some damage on it, then Persian might be able to finish it off. So Dodrio is another sort of discount Tauros. It's got a nice normal and flying type, which will give it stab on the good normal moves, and it learns Drill Peck, so it's got a little bit of coverage there. Now Dodrio is slower than Tauros with only 100 base speed, so you'll have to be careful as to when you bring it out. I see it come out as a lead because Dodrio Hyper Beam can one-shot certain Pokémon like Jinx, but damage calculation in Pokémon comes with a random range and only on a high roll does that actually happen. But it is faster than Jinx, and Jinx is a very common lead, but if that Hyper Beam doesn't get the KO, then Jinx's Blizzard for sure KOs Dodrio in one hit. Dodrio's Hyper Beam also has a chance to one-shot Alakazam at full. It's worth noting at least. Dodrio also has access to Agility, which is a nice way to counterplay the speed drop from Paralysis, and the Dodrio moveset usually goes Drill Peck, Body Slam, Hyper Beam, and Agility. So Arcanine is the worst of the wants to be Tauros Pokémon, and what holds Arcanine back is its typing. Arcanine just wants to be normal type so bad. It's got great stats all around, but not getting stab on your Body Slam and Hyper Beam really holds it back. And even though Fire Blast is its best attack, you'll find yourself Body Slamming those high special walls all day. Also, normal type Pokémon can't get paralyzed by Body Slam in Gen 1. So when you put Arcanine versus another physical attacker, it's highly likely that your Arcanine gets paralyzed by their Body Slam. And that's if they don't just Earthquake it, which it'll have weakness against. But Arcanine's moveset usually goes Body Slam, Hyper Beam, 
Fire Blast, and Agility. Okay, so Porygon is like a discount Chansey. Its stats are really low in every category, but because Chansey has this base 5 defense stat, Porygon will take body slams just a little bit better than Chansey does. And Porygon learns Recover. And Recover has significantly more power points than Soft Boil. And Recover has even more power points than Body Slam. So Porygon can potentially come into Snorlax and drain all of its power points. So long as Snorlax doesn't crit you twice in a row. But that's unlikely because crit rate is calculated with base speed in Gen 1. And then Porygon can have a lot of those other tools that you like to have on Chansey, such as Thunder Wave, Reflect, or Ice Beam. And then it could even have a Stab Hyper Beam if you wanted to surprise an enemy Chansey. But usually you just use Porygon for versus Snorlax, because Porygon is also conveniently faster than Snorlax. And Porygon doesn't like being in against Tauros because Tauros' Hyper Beam does like 70% to Porygon. The usual Porygon moveset goes Recover, Thunder Wave, Ice Beam, and Thunderbolt. The other discount Chansey is Clefable, and Clefable has a lot going for it. First of all, it has a meaningful defense stat, and it still has a decent enough special together with a high HP, so it can trade hits just fine. And it learns just about every move that you want to put on Chansey except for Soft Boiled. And it can't learn Recover either, so its only recovery move is Rest. Now Clefable probably has no problem resting in front of a Paralyzed Special Wall. And then it can also fish for freezes with Ice Beam, and Paralyze or Sing at other things. Clefable is not bad, it just isn't optimal. Because resting gives your opponent free turns, and they may take that as a setup opportunity, or maybe you get crit by a powerful psychic attack while you're asleep. But Clefable has an ace up its sleeve with Mega Kick. Mega Kick allows it to be a very threatening mixed attacker. A good move set for this would go Mega Kick, Hyper Beam, Blizzard, and Thunder Wave. Or you could go Blizzard, Thunderbolt, Body Slam, and Hyper Beam. There's a lot of options on Clefable, but what it has that makes it unique is having Mega Kick together with strong special moves. So I would rather play into its unique strengths rather than try to make it a poor man's Chansey. So Kangaskhan is kind of like a discount Snorlax. You have to really respect Kangaskhan's potential damage output, but I say potential because first of all, Kangaskhan's base attack is only 95, but it still gets stab on normal type moves. And its body slam is not as good as the other better normal types, but it can make up for that difference in damage with Mega Kick. So Mega Kick is a 120 power normal move with 75 accuracy. If you can hit two of those in a row, then Kangaskhan goes crazy. And that's because Mega Kick does about 50% to Chansey. It's big damage, but you'll miss a lot. And with average luck, Kangaskhan also becomes average, because it also doesn't have near the bulk of Snorlax. And it's so slow that it can't really act in any other role, except as a wall breaker or a progress maker. The usual Kangaskhan moveset goes something like Mega Kick, Earthquake, Surf, and Hyper Beam. But you've got some other options. You could go for the less impressive Body Slam for consistency, or Rock Slide as a different coverage move, but I like Earthquake for Gengar, and Surf because it obliterates rock types. Electrode is kind of like a much worse Jolteon but it has some unique qualities of its own. First, it's got Explosion, which can be huge, but then it also learns Light Screen, and Light Screen plus Rest could give it the ability to wall out special walls, but it's better as a lead that wants to use Thunder Wave, and then look for an Explosion opportunity, 
The problem with Electrode is that the ground types are so quick to come in on it, and the Pokemon that check electric types also checks explosion, so it can feel like you never have the opportunity to really explode on anything. And Jolteon has some great coverage moves like Pin Missile and Double Kick, but Electrode has zero coverage. But it does learn Hyper Beam. But that has the same problem as Explosion, because the same things that block Explosion block Hyper Beam. But something that Electrode does have up its sleeve is Screech. So Screech reduces the opponent's defense by two stages, which basically halves their defense. Screech together with Hyper Beam can make it a great wall breaker, but you could also pair Screech with Explosion. The usual Electrode moveset goes Thunderbolt, Thunder Wave, Screech, and then either Hyper Beam or Explosion. So you might at first think that Raichu is a worse Jolteon, but it has some unique qualities about it. First off, Raichu can learn Surf, and that means that those rock and ground types can't check it. Surf will one-shop all of those rock boys. Next, it can also learn Submission, which does big damage to Chansey, somewhere between 40 to 50%. But the recoil on that makes it a tough call, because Chansey will keep healing the damage so if it isn't already low, then that's a losing battle. But the Raichu moveset usually looks like Thunder Wave, Thunderbolt, Surf, and Submission. So Electabuzz has a good variety of moves, but it doesn't really have the stats to put behind any of those moves and it wants to be some kind of mixed attacker with only 83 base attack and 85 special. And it's not even bulky, so it doesn't trade well with anything. It can learn Psychic though, which is very interesting. And Electabuzz can learn Screech. So it has the potential to break through a Chansey. If you Screech at Chansey twice, the Electabuzz can one-shot it with a Hyper Beam from full, but they'll probably just switch on you before you can set all of that up. However, if you're really trying to make Electabuzz work, then a good moveset for Electabuzz goes Thunderbolt, Body Slam, Hyper Beam or Psychic, and Screech or Thunder Wave. It's just too bad that Electabuzz isn't also normal type, because that would give it a boost on Body Slam and Hyper Beam, and then prevent it from getting paralyzed by incoming Body Slams. Okay, so Magmar is like Fire-type Electabuzz. It's got all the same disadvantages of wanting to be a bad mixed attacker, but with slightly less speed and slightly better attack. But Magmar comes with Confuse Ray, so you could hope to get lucky. If you bring it out on something that was already paralyzed, or if you get a lucky paralysis off of Magmar's Body Slam, then you've always got the chance that Confuse Ray can get you through. Fire Blast would also be your big same type attack, and your last move might be Psychic or Hyper Beam. Aerodactyl is not as great as a mixed attacker as you might think because of its weakness to Blizzard, and Tauros and Snorlax, which are the two that you'd like to bring it in on, will pretty much always have. But if they didn't have Blizzard, Aerodactyl's Flying type gives it immunity to Earthquake, and the Rock typing gives it resistance to normal attacks. But Aerodactyl just doesn't have Rock Slide for some reason, or any other good same type moves in Gen 1. But the Mixed Attacker moveset would go Double Edge, Hyper Beam, Fire Blast, and then Agility or Toxic. Because Aerodactyl just doesn't learn enough moves, but it can learn Reflect, and paired up with Rest, if those normal types you'd like to put it in on don't bring Blizzard, then Aerodactyl can actually do something. And that's really common in Ubers, actually. Reflect, Rest, Aerodactyl is kinda good in Ubers, don't forget about it. But in Overused, everything brings Blizzard all day. The best way to describe Dugong is as exceedingly average. 
It also doesn't really fill any kind of role on a team. It's bulky, so you'd like to take advantage of rest and use it to trade hits. And water ice typing is pretty good, but Cloyster and Lapras are both better water ice types. Dugong also doesn't learn any unique moves that would put it above either of them, like how Lapras has Confuse Ray or Cloyster has Clamp. It does, however, have Headbutt, and it can learn Body Slam. Headbutt, again, has a 30% chance to flinch the opponent, and using that on an opponent while they're already paralyzed might be able to prevent them from doing anything at all. Obviously, you take Blizzard, as that's the best stab move that it has. And then Surf could be good, as it can hit a fire weakness that Blizzard doesn't cover, or Headbutt and Body Slam are good together, or you could just take one of them to make room for rest, or drop Surf for the rest. So Dugtrio is kind of bad. All ground types are immune to electric attacks though, so it has that use. But Dugtrio has no durability at all with that 35 base HP stat. It dies in one hit versus a lot of common top tiers. It does however have really good speed. At 120 speed, it's faster than Tauros and Starmie and Gengar. So they wouldn't be able to switch into Dugtrio if the attack that you're throwing on this turn would put them into range of the next turn. Dugtrio also, oddly enough, can learn Slash, which gives it a nice neutral damage attack against some things that resist ground. Dugtrio would pretty much only ever go Earthquake, Rock Slide, Slash, and then either Substitute or Toxic, because it just doesn't learn enough moves either, but that Substitute might be worth something in Stadium. So Gyarados has immunity to ground with its flying type, which can make it a good partner to a leading electric type, but it still has weakness to rock slide, which rock types like to throw on your switch prediction. And Gyarados also has a times 4 weakness to electric, so definitely don't keep it around anything that could have Thunderbolt. Now Gyarados wants to be like some sort of mixed attacker that usually goes Hydro Pump, Thunderbolt, Body Slam, and Hyper Beam. Hydro Pump instead of Surf usually for more impact, but it can also learn Blizzard or Fire Blast for other coverage types. And a lot of these off-meta picks seem to do better with a stronger move, even if it has less accuracy, to make up for its lack of other things. Omastar is an interesting pick because the rock type gives it resistance to normal attacks. But it's also weak to ground type attacks, so you'll have to watch out for that. But if the opponent Snorlax or Tauros doesn't bring Earthquake, then Omastar could potentially wall them out. But if they do, then you've almost wasted a team slot. And you've also got the proverbial rest plus reflect if you want to go that way on Omastar. Omastar is really great at punishing other low tier normal types that don't have Earthquake and it's the bee's knees against fire types. And Moltres does get played enough that Omastar can give you that benefit. On Omastar, I would go either Ice Beam or Blizzard, and then Hydro Pump or Surf, and Body Slam or Reflect, and then Rest as the last move. So Tangela is actually my favorite Pokemon. In Generation 1, it's got some bulk, and Tangela grows. It's got both growth and sword stance, and it comes with a base 100 special, so it would seem at first that it would be much better with growth than it is with sword stance, but growth only raises one stage at a time, whereas sword stance raises two stages at a time. But special is both special attack and special defense in Gen 1, so that's worth remembering. And Tangela can also pivot with Bind as a partially trapping move. The problem with Tangela is that its only special attack is Mega Drain. It does heal you, but it only has 40 power, or 60 rather, after the stab bonus. It does learn Hyper Beam though, and if you went Sword Stance, then that at least might be able to one-shot something. It also learns Stun Spore and Sleep Powder so it can provide its own setup opportunity. 
and with 60 base speed it's faster than Chansey and Snorlax, but hardly much else. If you want to go Growth, go with Mega Drain, Growth, Stun Spore, and Sleep Powder. Or you can also swap one of the status moves for Bind. Or for Sword Stance go Sword Stance, Hyper Beam, Sleep Powder, and then either Body Slam or Bind. Vaporeon has a good special stat, and a really high HP, so it can tango against other special walls, and even fight Tauros or Snorlax if it starts at full health. But Vaporeon is likely to get paralyzed by that body slam, and then all the special boys that aren't Alakazam like to bring Thunderbolt. So Vaporeon looks good, but it feels bad. It does learn Acid Armor, and Haze, so there's a lot of potential here. Also, Haze in Pokemon Stadium removes conditions like Burn and Paralysis. Acid Armor and Rest also go really well together. And then either Hydro Pump or Surf is fine, and then Haze or Blizzard or Body Slam is your last move. But if you really wanted to be spicy, you could take Mimic as your last move. So Mimic replaces itself with a random move known by the opponent's Pokemon. And if you're against a special wall, you might get lucky and get Recover or Soft Boiled. And if you get that on Vaporeon, it goes crazy. Or you might find Thunder Wave or Sing, which could also be really good. There's a lot of magic in Mimic, and you could really catch someone off guard by it. So Venusaur is not all that bad, really. It's got average at everything stats, but it's got Sleep Powder and Swords Dance together. It can also learn Growth, but also like Tangela, it can't make good use of it because the other grass move it learns is Razor Leaf. And Razor Leaf has a high crit rate, and critical hits ignore stat changes. But if you go Swords Dance, then you can still have Razor Leaf as a good stab move. I really like this move set on Venusaur. Sleep Powder, Rest, Sword Stance, and Hyper Beam. So Golduck is just a worse Slowbro, really. It learns Amnesia, and it's a lot faster than Slowbro, but not enough faster to outspeed anything important. And it doesn't have anywhere near the same bulk as Slowbro. And the psychic typing that Slowbro has is actually really relevant. And Golduck is just pure water type. Also, Slowbro can learn Thunder Wave, which can help it to set up. And Golduck doesn't learn any status moves at all. So, you're just really hoping with Golduck. And if you really wanted to play Golduck, the best set for it would be Blizzard, and then Hydro Pump or Surf, Amnesia, and Rest. Because Golduck just doesn't learn enough moves. Polyrath might be better than Golduck, but it still leagues below Slowbro. Polyrath is another Amnesia user, except Polyrath can also learn Hypnosis, so it has the chance to provide its own setup opportunity unlike Golduck. But being fighting type really holds it back as Psychic is so prevalent in the Gen 1 meta. But Polyrath gets Stab on Submission if you wanted to kill yourself to do about 60% to Chansey with one move. I probably wouldn't even take Submission. I would rather just Amnesia boost over it. But Polyrath's other type, Water, has electric weakness, and Thunderbolts are everywhere too. Polyrath just has so many weaknesses, it's just really positioned poorly in the meta. But the Polyrath moveset usually goes Hydro Pump or Surf, and then Blizzard, Hypnosis, and Amnesia. Polyrath is also just short of the bulk that Slowbro has, but hilariously enough, Poliwhirl actually has a higher base speed than Polyrath does. So Kabutops is really cool in Gen 1. The rock type resists normal attacks, but it's also weak to ground type attacks, and Earthquake is a pretty common move in Gen 1. 
but Kabutops learns Swords Dance, and it's got a nice 115 base attack stat, and it can learn Slash. There's a lot of potential to win some games with Kabutops. I would go Swords Dance, Slash, Hyper Beam, and then either Surf or Hydro Pump. I would like to bring Kabutops in on a sleeping or paralyzed opponent and try to use that as a setup opportunity, especially if it's a Snorlax that doesn't have Earthquake. And Slash will get through Reflect, which is a common move on resting Snorlax. Or you can also bring Kabutops in on a predicted Rock Slide from a Rock-type Pokémon, because you can threaten their Rock-type with Surf. But just don't come in on a Stab Earthquake, because that would be really bad. Rhydon's Earthquake does like 90% to Kabutops, but if you think that they're going to switch, then you could use Swords Dance on the turn that they switch, and be very strong against whatever comes out next. But you could also one-shot any of the Rock types with that Stab Surf if you think they're going to stay in. The King of Crabs is another Swords Dance user, with an absolute insane 130 base attack stat. Kingler is like Kabutops without the rock typing, and instead of Slash you've got Crab Hammer, which is a 90 power, 85 accuracy move with a high crit rate. That's a 180 power after the crit, plus the stab makes it 270 power. Crab Hammer is absolutely bonkers. Now the Kingler moveset goes Swords Dance, Crab Hammer, Hyper Beam, and Body Slam. Kingler also has a really high defense, so it can trade well with Snorlax and Tauros. And then Kingler can Swords Dance against a Snorlax if it goes to sleep. So Mr. Mime is kind of bad in Gen 1. It's got no bulk, no speed, no recover move, and no hypnosis. Although it can learn hypnosis through this tradebacks mechanic between gold and silver, but trading back to red and blue is not usually allowed in Gen 1 tournaments. And Pokemon Stadium doesn't allow tradeback moves either. So with all of these negatives, what can Mr. Mime actually do? Well, it's got barrier and light screen, and Thunder Wave is a status move, and Rest is all it can really do to recover. And for attacking moves, you'll take Psychic or Seismic Toss. With 90 base speed, it just gets hit before it can put up that first barrier, and without recover, it's just a significantly worse Alakazam. But if you really wanted to play Mr. Mime, I would go with either Psychic or Seismic Toss, then Thunder Wave, Rest, and either Light Screen or Barrier and maybe drop Thunder Wave for both Psychic and Seismic Toss. If you've already got other status spreaders on your team, then you don't necessarily need another Pokémon with Thunder Wave. Mr. Mime could bury your Snorlax, but Tauros is faster and will put Mr. Mime in range before it can set up. Alright, so Nidoking has a lot of moves, and it has a lot of weaknesses too, like Water, Ice, Psychic, and Ground. It's like just about every Pokémon in the meta has a weakness move to throw at Nidoking. But Nidoking has immunity to electric attacks with its Ground type, and that's actually significant because it's immune to Thunder Wave. But it can still be paralyzed by Body Slam and Stun Spore, which are also really common. Now, Nidoking is usually trying to be some sort of mixed attacker, taking advantage of the Stab Earthquake, together with its great coverage options. But in Pokémon Stadium, where Focus Energy actually works like it's supposed to, then with the Focus Energy up, Nidoking will basically crit every move and it can become very threatening. But it's also just not fast enough to sweep either, because Starmie and Alakazam will just outspeed it and hit it with a big weakness move. But if you save Nidoking for late game where those things might already be paralyzed, then it has the potential to sweep. Nidoking does survive one attack from Alakazam or Starmie from full health if it doesn't crit. And remember that focus energy is programmed wrong and just doesn't work in regular Link battles.
So Raticate is a super cheese Pokemon. Super Fang is a move that cuts the opponent's remaining HP in half, which more often than not puts them in range of a stab Hyper Beam. And then it can also learn Bubble Beam for coverage on those rock and ground types. And then usually Body Slam is its last move. Raticate is a great way to punish slower Pokemon for using Rest, or you could even potentially catch some paralyzed walls off guard with it. Now, Venomoth has access to both Sleep Powder and Stun Spore, and it has a 90 base special stat, and it learns Psychic, and it could almost do something if it didn't have this weakness to Psychic. Its last move could be Double Edge, or with Mega Drain, it could easily stay in against a Starmie that doesn't have Psychic. Venomoth is almost good enough to be playable, but I really don't think it is. So Wigglytuff is like a worse Clefable. It's got a lot of cool special moves with no special stat to put behind it. But it does have a fat 140 base HP stat. And it's got 70 base attack, so it could throw Mega Kicks at Chansey. And it can also learn Thunder Wave and Hyper Beam. And you might take Seismic Toss or Body Slam as your last attack. Wigglytuff might actually be able to get away with Reflect and Rest also. And you could build it like a Reflect Snorlax to spam Ice Beams. And it can learn Sing, too. If I was going to go Wigglytuff, I would go something like Mega Kick, Thunder Wave, Rest, and Sing. Or if I wanted to play Reflect, I would go Reflect, Ice Beam, Rest, and Thunder Wave. It also would probably be able to bait Snorlax and Tauros with Counter. Wigglytuff won't be able to KO them from full with Counter, but countering a Body Slam with Wigglytuff from Tauros or Snorlax still does about 300 damage. And they probably won't expect it since you'd use a different move first. So Machamp is very appealing, but it never gets to fulfill its role. In Gen 1, Low Kick is a 50 power fighting move with 90 accuracy and has a 30% chance to flinch the opponent. And Machamp just happens to be faster than both Snorlax and Chansey. But you already know that the opponent will straight away switch out, so you never get to do it. But the Machamp move set usually goes something like Low Kick, Body Slam, Hyper Beam, and Earthquake. And then Psychic types will switch in on Machamp and resist your fighting type attack, and then they'll come at you with a big stab weakness psychic attack. So Scyther is pretty cool. It's got Swords Dance, Slash, Hyper Beam, and Agility. And Scyther is fine as a Swords Dancer. Slash is nice because it circumvents Reflect, but the flying type it has gives it a weakness to Ice, and it feels like everything in the meta has an Ice attack, and then it's also weak to Electric attacks, and then it has a really inconvenient times 4 weakness to Rock Slide, so those bulky Rock types will come in to block your normal moves, and then also one-shot you with Rock Slide. The other Swords Dancers are better, but Scyther's Flying type does give it a ground immunity for what that's worth. It also doesn't have any good stab moves like how Kingler or Kabutops have water moves to match their own water typing. With Scyther's Bug and Flying typing, there just aren't a lot of good Bug or Flying type moves, and there aren't any that Scyther can learn. So Vileplume has access to both Sleep Powder and Stun Spore, and Sword Stance, and it can also learn Hyper Beam and Body Slam. Having status moves allows it to create its own setup opportunity, and I would probably go without Stun Spore to make room for Mega Drain, which will prevent Rock types from blocking your normal moves. 
At 50 base speed though, it's slower than basically everything. So after you get set up with Vile Plume, just about everything that isn't paralyzed hits you before you hit them. And that's why Vile Plume isn't played all that much. And it also doesn't have any kind of trapping move like Wrap. So there's a lot of potential with Vile Plume, but it just isn't really built to do what you want to do with it. So Ditto is actually not unplayable, but you might think that it is by looking at its base stats. But something very interesting about Transform is that it copies the stat ups without copying the conditions like Paralysis or Sleep. And if an opponent is boosting up with something like Amnesia, you could potentially copy all of their boosts in a single turn. And in Ubers, you could copy their Amnesia Mewtwo and have two Mewtwo's for yourself. So Farfetch'd is interesting because it can learn Swords Dance, and it also gets Stab on Slash, but unfortunately it can't learn Hyper Beam. So I guess you would go something like Swords Dance, Slash, Body Slam, and then either Agility or Substitute. Just remember that critical hits ignore stat changes, so you want to look at your high crit move as sort of a neutral damage kind of attack. So, Golbat is another one of those ones that you might think are unplayable, but it actually has a role in Ubers. Against a Sword Stance Mew, it dodges Earthquake. And Sword Stance Mew might not have another attacking move that isn't Explosion, so that's pretty funny. But then it's also got Confuse Ray, which, if you're lucky, you can get a lot of mileage out of, actually. And confusing an already paralyzed opponent is just hell for them. Golbat also brings Screech, which can force just about anything out if you switch to a more threatening physical attacker afterwards. But also, Leech Life is super effective on Psychic types, and with their defense cut in half by Screech, you might actually be able to chip them down if they're also confused and maybe also paralyzed. So Parasect is very interesting because it learns Spore, which is the only sleep move with 100 accuracy in Gen 1. And it also learns Sword Stance, and Slash, and Hyper Beam 2. It has the whole Sword Stance set. So Sandslash is yet another sword stancer, except this time in ground type. So you could come in on a Jolteon and scare it out. And on the turn that it switches out, you can use Sword Stance. Sandslash is nice because it also has good stab move with Earthquake. And it can also learn Hyper Beam. And Body Slam to round out the move set. Just watch out for its weaknesses because Sandslash doesn't take special attacks very well. And with that, we're at the end of all the fringe viable Pokémon. There's a handful of other ones that I didn't talk about, but there's just not much you can do with them. Like Muck or Weezing both have Explosion, but they're just going to take one hit and immediately have to explode. Or the other fighting types that aren't Machamp just don't have enough bulk to be able to switch into anything at all, or even enough other stats to make up for it. And there just aren't any great fighting type moves in this game. And then Seedra and Seeking have nothing unique about them to compensate for just being weaker than other water types. Or poor Blastoise just doesn't have anything going for it at all. The best it can hope to be is a bad mixed attacker that can't switch into anything. And then Dodrio is already barely playable, and the other birds have basically the same move pool but with less speed and less attack. Or Butterfree is also like an even less playable Venomoth. And poor Beedrill just isn't viable, as much as I would like for it to be. And Magneton is another Pokémon that just isn't. It's too slow and not bulky enough, it's got no coverage, and it can't even explode. 
And Nido Queen is also quite similar to Nido King, except it can't learn Focus Energy, which would be the one special thing about it if you were playing on Stadium. So team building is all about choosing a win condition. The over-centralized meta is largely about trying to wear down and paralyze everything so that you can sweep with Tauros at the end. And those teams tend to look like these. And you'll notice that basically every team plays Chansey, Tauros, and Snorlax. They are without a doubt the best three Pokémon in Gen 1. And it's hard to justify going without any of them. Any team missing even a single one of these could easily put your team in a lower tier. And then Alakazam, Starmie, and Executor are the next best three. And you could very easily just take these top six Pokémon and beat everyone forever. And then the small variations to these teams can be whether you want a Sleep Lead or a Paralysis Lead, do you want to go with or without a Rock type, do you want to play with a Pokémon like Zapdos or Jolteon that gets blocked by Rock types, and if you do, then would you like to pair those up with something that likes to switch in on Rock types, like Executor or maybe Gyarados? Trying to fill all of your defensive holes is a large part of team building and making sure that you have all of the important checks covered. Try to think about which Pokémon like to pair up with which other certain Pokémon, because a lot of your matches will just be switching around constantly. And then here are some sample Sword Stance and Amnesia-style teams. If you want to play a boosting strategy like Sword Stance or Amnesia, then you need to think about what your opportunities are and what conditions do you need for the table to be set. Like, does a particular Pokémon on the enemy team need to be knocked out first? Or do you need certain other ones to be paralyzed so that your Sword Stancer can be faster than them? Also, with the Sword Stance teams, you might like to send out Tauros before your Sword Dancer if you can, as Tauros will grind down more of their resources and maybe even paralyze something before it goes down. And then here are what some sample trapping teams look like. With trapping strategies, you might like to have at least two Pokémon with a trapping move, and a good amount of status spreaders to hopefully paralyze the enemy team. And you might also like to use Tauros before the trapper for the same reasons as the boosting strats. Or another strategy is to just look to trade up as much as possible with lots of statuses, recovery moves, and explosions. And here's a few examples of that. And then lastly, some other great resources that I want you to have. First, if you're playing on something like Pokémon Showdown, then you can click on or hover over the Pokémon sprites for additional information, like PP usage, and more notably speed values. So you can see that information easily without having to memorize it. Also, there's the super handy Pokémon damage calculator. You pick your generation up at the top here, and then plug in the two Pokémon on each side, and then you'll know exactly how much damage a move can do, and exactly how many hits it takes to KO a particular enemy with a specific move. It's very handy for checking Explosion Hyper Beam KO ranges, and you could easily just play all of your net battles with the damage calculator open in another window. Also, there's this website called Smogin.com, where you can look up any particular Pokémon that you're interested in, and see a bunch of strategies that people have for it. And lastly, don't be afraid of looking at a type chart when you need to. There's a lot of uncommon interactions that will catch you off guard from time to time. Also, the weakness and resistances have changed a little bit here and there across different generations. So just have quick access to a chart that you can reference on the fly. And with that, I've given you everything that you need to be good at Generation 1 Pokémon.